Uh, so, so I'm delighted to welcome Anna this evening and uh, as I say we are not experimenting with this format but we'll see how this goes and we'll be doing others in the future but we really appreciate your feedback uh, afterwards too and for you to be as involved as possible. I know on some of the meetings um, we very much, you've kind of put your questions and I've then placed the questions to people on webinars and so on but I think tonight if people are happy to come off of um, mute and ask their own questions that'd be fantastic. I know some people have sent me some questions which is brilliant uh, but it'd be nice to get you involved this evening too. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick introduction to uh, Anna. Anna was a journalist uh, at The Guardian, The Observer from 2004 until 2019 and she covered three Olympic Games several World Cups, Euros, World Championships, um, and across that time also interviewed some of the biggest stars in global sport. And Anna's now um, Telegraph Women's Sports Editor, which I'm sure she'll talk more about this evening. Um, Anna co-founded and then went on to chair Women in Football, the charity which does so much um, to lobby against sexism in the game um, and also champions female role models. Um, Anna, in 2007, 17 launched the Blue Plaque Rebellion with the Women's Sport Trust, which celebrated female pioneers in uh, women's sport history. Uh, and in two, I uh, embarrass Anna now, in 2016, she was awarded an MBE for her services to journalism and women in sport. Um, and that was also the year uh, that her amazing book, Eat Sweat Play How Sport Can Change Your Life, was published with Macmillan. I was lucky enough to interview Anna. For the second season of the Game Changers podcast, so she talked really openly about her career path and, and shared her thoughts on women's sport. Um, and I'll share a link to that actually after this, if you want to, to know more, if you're not already listening to the Game Changers. Um, so I say your, your feedback would be very welcome. The plan is uh, Anna's kindly going to give a little short reading from the book to kick us off and get us started. Um, and then I've got some lots of questions. I could talk to her all evening and ask questions, but that's not what it's all about. So I've got some questions to get started, but it would be really lovely as I say, if people would like to then put their questions and, and share their thoughts on the book really. So we'll uh, see how that goes from there. And, and hopefully, as I say, to make it as relaxed and informal, like a normal book club, but without the wine, unless actually look, look you might have wine. <laughs> it's a bit early for wine, uh, but we're hoping, we've never done an online book club before, but we're hoping that this might work, but um, yeah be in down to all of your contribution too. Um, so Anna, if that's okay, if that's a, a rattle through an instruction there, I will pass across to you. And I think Kate's gonna pop you on spotlight. So you might appear uh, big on the screen for the moment. Oh dear, that is big. <laughs> oh no, I was much happier looking at all your lovely faces. Oh, let's do gallery. You can then. change your gallery, yeah, you can change Then I can see yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much to everybody who's joined us. Really appreciate it because you've probably spent the whole day in that position on that chair looking at that laptop, that screen. I know I have uh, just just about um, crashed the book club by quickly popping down to cook fish fingers for the kids that went a bit wrong. They're, they're bound to come up and complain. That, I don't know, we're going to run out of ketchup or something. Some terrible disaster. So apologies if that does happen. Um, thank you very much for having me. And um, some of you may have already read Eat Sweat Play. It's been around for a little while. But if you haven't, I'm going to do a quick reading now. Um, the first thing to say about this book is, I have to make this absolutely clear, this is not me. It's, it's the number one question that I always get asked. No, this is not a photograph of my neck um people always think it is but uh i would say that i am an equally sweaty person as as the lovely next lady on on the front of this book i definitely am that person at, at the back of the class that's dripping no matter what activity i'm doing really um so with that in mind i'm gonna read a little bit from chapter two which is exactly about sweating uh, it's called sweating is so hot right now why our 21st century obsession with exercise is all wrong um i think thanks to all of you amazing women on this call it's actually it well it's going in the right direction isn't it and i think so much has has changed since this book was published and, and since i was writing it uh prior to 2016 but some things have stuck around and i think there are familiar tropes that we still come up against so it'd be quite interesting to sort of think a bit about what has changed and what hasn't. Anyway, let's start with some nakedness, because that's always a good place to start. Um, I'll never forget the first time I saw a naked woman that wasn't my mum. I was 12. She was a grown up and standing in the showers at Park Road Swimming Pool, North London, soaping her pubic hair into a lather. 
I don't remember anything about her face, which says far too much about women's bodies, the way we're depicted. Um, just her body, sinewy, with some wobbly bits and a big bush down below. Swimming pool changing rooms have always been instructive. One of the few places where you see naked women, real ones, I mean, just going about their business, getting changed or having a wash. At the time, the sight of women unapologetically displaying their bodies prompted giggles, embarrassment and the odd sneer of derision from me and my school age friends. As a 12 year old, I generally interpreted those women as 1970s exhibitionist feminist types making some sort of explosive political gender statement uh, with uninhibited pubes. Um, I think there's probably not a single person on this call that doesn't have uninhibited pubes at the moment. And uh, it's probably becoming the norm in 2021. So there we go. That's good, isn't it? Um, sadly, I'm not sure how many women or men ever grow out of that opinion. Certainly for pubescent girls, showing any part of your naked body is anathema, which made getting undressed in a public change room really challenging. It was an unspoken rule that you had to undress without anyone catching sight of your body. Welcome to the impossible world of teenage logic. Um, and there follows a description of, I don't know how many of you used to do this, but in our PE lessons, we could never take our top off. Um, we had to like pull our arms into our top and then do all the changing under the cover of the top. And, you know, it was it was so awkward. It was so ridiculous. And then when you see, you know, then I went on to, to, to go and work in the wonderful world of sport and saw that men just stroll around changing rooms and boys just stroll around changing rooms with it all swinging about and, you know, even giving each other the odd flick. Uh, it's completely different really well that that really surprised me and um, the lengths we go to to not expose our bodies is extraordinary the irony of course is that women's bodies are constantly on display in the public sphere and yet we remain so uncomfortable about revealing our bodies even in a private setting this no doubt perpetuates the recurring women's magazine topic, how to work up the courage to undress in front of your partner with the lights on, which makes me so sad that those articles still appear today. That there are women who have been married for years still unable to show their bodies to their partners makes me desperately sad. The crazy thing is that in shunning this safe female space, uh, a changing room, an important reality check is absent from our everyday lives. Namely, that boobs and bums really do tend to look like the wobbly things that I first saw at the Park Road pool all those years ago, and not the pneumatic weaponry depicted daily in the mainstream media. They also tend to be accompanied by a fascinating panoply of pubic hair, which, if you are to believe the images we see every day, is an endangered species in the 21st century. I think. Um, female body image and its associated woes is currently one of the biggest obstacles holding women back in the Western world. It is also one of the biggest contributing factors preventing women from being physically active in the first place. Um, a recent Sport England report, not recent anymore, found that 75% of the women they surveyed wanted to take part in sport but were inhibited by fear of being judged on their appearance and ability. The study also highlighted that one in five men think sporty women are not feminine, whatever that is. Cruelly, our own messed up ideas about body image are preventing us from doing the one thing that could liberate us all. Um, I'm going to stop there because I think I'll leave you to read the rest if you like the sound of it. I could just have you read all evening and that was fantastic. Oh, oh, what a way to start. Yeah. Naked bodies in changing rooms. That's it's a good start to the evening. Yeah. It's a good conversation starter. <laughs> I think so. If I could do just to start, and I have got lots of questions from people already, but just to start with a few questions, I guess to take you back to set the scene of when you wrote the book initially. So, why did you decide to write the book, and, and what were you doing in life wise um, at the time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I suppose it would have been around 2014. So there was a sense of things changing around women's sport. Um, we'd had the 2012 Olympics and we'd seen these amazing, you know, Jess Ennis um, in particular being the poster girl for that Olympic Games. And it was the first time, I think, in this country that we'd really seen women in such a prominent position um, and, and people like Ellie Simmons becoming household names too. Um, and then there was the cold conversation in Parliament, you know, Maria Miller banging the drum and saying things must change and sports media is not representative and women's sport is not getting a fair look in. So that those were all important conversations happening. Um, 
and and I was approached and, and someone said can you write a they had a very specific idea they wanted me to write the female version of fever pitch <laughs> um and and I just said oh you know honestly that that's not me I I'm not Nick Hornby I didn't grow up loving women's sport as a kid in fact I bunked almost all my PE lessons and um my parents had sort of mm, they they had some reservations about sport and um, my dad was South African Jewish and he'd seen how sport had been used in the apartheid era as a as a way to persecute people and oppress people through racism um, and my mum was a refugee from the war Czech refugee and she'd seen the whole Nazi ideology and uh, yeah you know sport sports got some bad reps at times so yeah I didn't exactly grow up a sports fan and I just said oh I'm really sorry I can't write that book um a, a typical sort of theme oh, I, don't, I don't like to generalize but it probably is a bit female because what I should have said was you know I'd love to actually write this book and I didn't anyway luckily they were very kind and they said oh well even if you don't want to write that book you should write a book so uh why don't you have a think <laughs> And I remember saying to my mum, it was like over Christmas, I said, oh, I don't think I've got anything to write about. I don't, I don't think I've got a book to write about. And, you know, and I'm sure lots of you on this call would probably have a similar thought. So ignore that thought. It's, it's a stupid thought. And just, you know, and think what book you could write or what amazing project you could do, because it is there within you. Um, anyway, in the end, I decided to write a book about sport for women who didn't necessarily like sport or women who felt alienated by sport even if they loved it for all the sort of structural reasons and it did seem a ridiculous book to pitch okay so the main target audience are uh, is going to be women who don't like sport but it's about sport you know what what's the sales pitch on that <laughs> how many people are going to buy that um but luckily for me um what what seemed a ridiculous conversation quickly became quite a normal conversation thanks to this girl can and the sporting England campaign that really just brought about that mainstream conversation um and spoke to women about all the different issues that that we face whether we love sport whether we loathe it whether whether we think we could love it but for some reason we have sort of um hesitations around it and so that that then became a normal conversation and that's that's what the book started to follow and what was the process of writing like for you? Because you're obviously still working at the time. You were it wasn't like you took a few months off to go to South France and write a book, did you? But um, <laughs> that would have been really good. Why didn't I do that? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I did happen to get pregnant part way through the process. <laughs> it became a bit challenging, um, and we had to change the publication date of the book as a result, um, and got quite physically uncomfortable at times, <laughs> sitting for long periods. Yeah. My poor second child was like hammering on my uterus. This is not comfortable, Mum. And turns out she's really sporty, which she was indicating quite early on <laughs> in the womb. <laughs> um anyway yeah it, it was it was a difficult process I think I think anytime you take on a new project or something unfamiliar or something that feels daunting you, you can feel completely overwhelmed and I'm sure you felt that way when you were writing your book or all the new innovations that you've done so and I'm sure everybody can relate to that on this call but once you actually get into it and realize that you know this is the subject that we we've all been working in for years you know we know we know this subject we've lived and breathed it and so therefore if you just allow yourself to sit at the desk without fretting for a bit it does start to sort of flow out excellent and are there any particular chapters looking back now that you're most proud of or you feel have had the biggest impact it'll be interesting to get people's thoughts around the call as well and to those that they you know I think we've all got I thought if you've read it I've, there's elements of it that have really stuck with me but is there anything looking back now that you feel had a specific impact or meant most to you um i think the chapters that kind of reinforce this idea about um about the joy that you get from sport um and the i still get messages in fact i've got one today <laughs> um uh, when when it when it uh, was published i got them pretty much every day in floods um and now sort of four years on I, I still get them probably i don't know one or two a week maybe of people saying i read this book and it changed my life um and it, it's just it's quite extraordinary to to receive that and um and they all say pretty much the same thing 
they all say, I've, you know, I thought I didn't like sport or I used to like sport and exercise. And then I fell out of it during my teenage years. Um, I used to think of it, some say I used to think of it as, as a weight loss thing or, or I hated it or whatever. And now I've realized that here are all the wonderful things about it. And it's just brought me so much. Um, so, yeah, that's. That, that's quite extraordinary I didn't I didn't know that that was going to happen I didn't ex God, couldn't have expected that that would happen but it's been the absolute best thing about it for me excellent right, it's good to hear and you look at the Amazon reviews and the comments and things you can see how much it has changed people's lives isn't it oh god don't read those there's some horrible <laughs> ones in there <laughs> oh, there's some nutters oh, no. as well, of course yeah <laughs> um the book was published as you say in June 2016 so where Sort of since launch, have you seen the biggest changes for women's sport? And I realise that that could be a whole evening's conversation, but, you know, in, in some, uh, maybe some positives and then also some negatives there since, because it's nearly five years ago, well, six years ago, isn't it, since you wrote, probably. Yeah, um, I think, God, the profile of women's sport has really rocketed in that time, which is amazing. Um, some of the conversations that, when I was writing the book, simply weren't being had, for example, periods in sport. I mean, we had a whole front page of the sports section about periods and about the fact that Chelsea Football Club was using, you know, tailoring the menstrual cycle to kind of harness the power of athletes. Um, when At the time that I was writing the book, you couldn't even talk about periods on a sports desk because the blokes would just say, well, what's, you know, I don't think how... I don't think our readers are ready for that. Um, it, as if, you know, we'd all embarrass them and it would be awful, um, silly women with their periods. So th that's definitely changed. Whereas now it's become, I think, almost quite trendy. Although we still, I would say we still do have a really long way to go for, for all coaches and all kind of high performance um, down to grassroots to be more supportive of women's physical needs, not just periods, but, you know, body differences and, and emotional challenges and right across the gamut the, the Caroline Criado Perez piece of work about data gender gap and behaviors and all of that is still incredibly relevant but I think some of that's changed um there's been some really obvious brilliant things like the women's super league becoming professional that's been great uh, the new tv deal that women's super league will be on the bbc from september this year amazing free to air um women england women's rugby players getting paid <laughs> i can't believe we have to celebrate that but we do um as ridiculous as that sounds so yeah some really big milestones which are great um and I, I hope that the pandemic doesn't undo all of that important work. But it, yeah. Yeah, which leads me into the next questions, actually. Uh, lovely, Lisa Wright, are you happy to come off mute and ask your own question rather than me reading your words for you? Would that be OK? Can you remember what you asked? Uh, just about, I think. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yes, yeah, so my uh, children are in the other room and, and eating a bowl of some kind of pasta that I threw at them. So yeah, I'm, it's fine. Um, and then hearing that we're going to be homeschooling for a God knows how much longer today as well. Oh, oh, the worst news. Yeah. I know. I'm trying to drink herbal tea rather than wine. So I'm trying to be good. Um, so yeah, so um, interesting you say that about uh, the profile of women's sport and things. One of the questions uh, that's been in my mind uh, recently, especially during the pandemic is like you say, the profile of women's sport gone up hugely and um, you know the lionesses the world cup you know i went to wembley to watch them play germany and it, it was just amazing i had my daughter with me it was the best time ever during the pandemic we've seen sport get cancelled across the board and then things be reintroduced and then a lot of women's teams and activities have still been cancelled whereas the men's equivalents have been allowed to go ahead like the fa cup for instance so it just made me think that has everything that we've gone through just been tokenism and, you know, the hierarchy is saying, oh, they, they've done really well, they've done really well. But when it actually comes to it, they don't believe in it as much as they do male sports and they don't consider it to be as important or as professional, maybe. Um, and they can just think that they can just pause it regardless. That was my question. That's a good question, Lisa. I've been asking myself that question a lot since the pandemic hit. Um, you know, as you say, the evidence is undeniable. Men's football came back after three months. Women's football was gone for six months. All the debacle around the FA Cup and whether there was going to be a coin toss to decide it. Um, girls' football academies being closed while their friends, boy, who happened to be boys, were allowed to carry on training. 
um and that that's just football i could go through every sport um, in fact let's not leave out other sports sorry cricket but when stuart broad was allowed into the england women's toilets uh while the england women had to stay home that was a moment for me where i just got really annoyed <laughs> sorry if there's anyone on here from the ecb i know you've been trying your best but that that really annoyed me um yeah there's been a lot of challenges i I don't think anyone sort of consciously, or if they do, they're really bad, but I think most people kind of don't consciously think, oh, it's fine if we don't let the women back. But the thing is, all of the existing inequalities have just been massively exposed by this pandemic. And as everything's been reined back in, and you know, we've got to be honest, sports governing bodies are losing millions of pounds and are worried for their future. A lot of sports are. And I, I think that, you know, we can't be flippant about that. But I just, I would like to see that those kind of survival plans and recovery plans hold women in, in equal priority to men. And I understand that often men's sport is the sport that brings in the revenue. And therefore, it's kind of natural to devote your attention to that and think that that is the survival route out of this pandemic. But I think if we do that, we're only ever going to keep kicking women's sport down. Um, and unless you actively invest in women's sport and recognise that there are opportunities within women's sport, um, commercially as well because let's remember that sponsors are very very keen to show how kind of a CSR minded they are um, and some of the most exciting commercial campaigns have been in you you know using sports women um, yeah so I think it's short-sighted to kind of throw women out uh, out the window at a time of need and I think it, you know you can't really deny the optics on it of in in times of of largesse and and enjoyment we can afford to have equality but in times of hardship we have to chuck equality out the window I, I, you know that's how it that is really how it's been um and i think governing bodies are just gonna have to work well everybody's gonna have to work a little bit harder to try and fight against that but i, I recognize it's not easy thank yeah. you lisa thank you. um Anna, can I ask you just to talk a little bit about your role at the Telegraph now and, and perhaps what the Telegraph's been doing and, and what you've experienced in the last six to nine months. And then actually Lucy Ricketts got a fabulous question, so I'm going to ask her if she's on the call to come off and, and ask that that relates to, to the Telegraph Women's Sport. Um, yeah, so the last the last year was kind of crazy. I mean, we were we were gearing up in March to have this really special event to celebrate our first birthday. Um, and we had Andy Murray signed up as kind of a you know feminist for the front cover of the supplement. We were really excited about that, and uh, we'd had all this exclusive behind the scenes time with him and. We, we had we had all the bells on and then about 10 days beforehand we had to cancel this this big event um and suddenly we were you know locked out of the office and back in our homes and there was no women's sport and our whole entire department didn't know we didn't know what the future held you know like for like everybody nobody knew what the future held but I think for women's sport there was a particularly big question mark over it um, so we set about the task of trying to report on on the way that women's sport was being affected by the on the, by the pandemic, um, which wasn't easy to do. Um, lots of people didn't want us to report about it, which I I understand. Um, I, I don't, you know, if you're within an organisation that's doing its best and, and trying to trying to survive and trying to make the best decisions that you can at a time when people are dying and nobody knows what's happening, that, that must have been incredibly hard. Um, and I can understand that you wouldn't have want a journalist poking about to ask <laughs> what money you're spending on women compared to what money you're spending on men, etc. But that is what we tried to do because we felt it was really important to, uh, to document what was happening to women at this time, as I think journalists all around the world were doing across all the different spheres um, you know we know that women um, despite being less likely I think they were saying to be um, fatal victims of the pandemic we were more likely to suffer in other ways and um, particularly when it came to sort of taking economic burden or emotional burden or missing out on opportunities or career career prospects and so on um, so yeah we spent the first three months or of the year very sort of intensively working on that um and then there were lots of other interesting narratives that happened in the year um it was really great the way that um we were able to talk talk to paralympians who spoke really honestly about how the, the pandemic was affecting their careers um and and 
that was really relatable, I think, to, to the wider disabled community in this country and the way that, you know, even when facilities were open and access was now available, uh, they still couldn't access it because there were lots of other um, kind of restrictions around the COVID guidelines that just weren't uh, designed or suitable or designed in mind with disabled people that was really frustrating. Um, and of course, there was the whole Black Lives Matter movement, which was um, incredibly powerful, um, very difficult for for well pretty much everybody in, in the black community um to to hear those stories to to watch those videos um and to then be faced with these really difficult conversations um and so we we tried to honor that um that those protests and those conversations and we did so with a, a special supplement that came out in june um and then i suppose the other Big event of the year was well it wasn't a, an event but the move the big movement of the gymnasts alliance and the way that i think women really led that women gymnasts um in britain speaking out about the abuse that they felt that they had faced in their sport and we'd just never seen anything like that before um and it was incredibly moving and incredibly powerful um and I, I think you know since tanny gray thompson's duty of care report which was nearly four years ago now um 2017 we hadn't really seen a conversation as big as that um, happening in sports. So as awful as the stories were and as difficult as it was for the gymnasts um, and, and the governing body, of course, too, and the sport, um, I thought it was a really important and powerful moment. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. Lucy, are you happy? I've actually just asked her and she is happy to ask your question. I think it relates quite a bit to, I guess, the Telegraph and, and all that's happening in the area of women's sport. I can't yeah, see definitely. you. Sorry, okay. no. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, I think, and I think, um, you know, I think the Telegraph Women's Sport, I just want to say, obviously, I'm sure everyone agrees, but it's like obviously an amazing and it's such a long awaited step that we've had into opening up the world of women's sport and almost like normalizing that bigger picture and like reading about it, something that I, you know, never did growing up. Um, but one thing I always think when, I, when I'm reading it is that, you know, I've got, so many friends who are active and, and they play sport and, and they surf and yes they played sports school or they might be sort of casual gym goers those people sort of in your chapter one that you talk about like bunking off PE like I was so many friends that I think of and I'm like yeah that, that was that was them I mean I loved um, PE and whatever at school but there are so many people that don't um you know play at that elite level and who don't work in sport like we all know about it because we work in sport and and like they wouldn't know that it exists and I just I you know I wondered if you had any thoughts on how you think that I think lots of people as well maybe think that you've got to subscribe to the, 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 the Telegraph and, and they might not read the Telegraph um, and and how you think sort of moving forwards so we can always target those like casual audiences that I'd say in sport and get them reading and watching women's sport and sort of make it a norm from those young teenage years um, yeah yeah I think that's a question that so many people are asking themselves you know how do you change a cultural habit um and i still see on social media all the time men who are like well why does any, any of this matter because you know women don't really follow sport in great numbers anyway so who cares um and well i guess that's that's partly what we're trying to change um telegraph is a subscription newspaper but i'm very happy to say that almost all of the women's sports content is open access um so you don't need to subscribe which is great. Um, we also have a women's sports social media editor called Fadimo Ola who came on board with us in February and she's a genius and explains all the things that I don't understand about social. She like literally <laughs> screenshots me instructions sometimes um, but she's right across uh, TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram and all those places where um, a younger audience is hanging out and um, kind of can engage in women's sports stories in a slightly different way to the more traditional reader who might like to kind of sit down and work their way through an article um, they often with younger people generation z as they like to call them you know th there's different ways of engaging in in media narratives so it's really great to see her kind of exploring those with great success actually the tiktok videos have done really really well and there was like explainers of women's football um I think it was the Champions League stuff that she was doing. Yeah, loads of great things. Um, in terms of how we change or how we grow a women's sport audience more widely, I mean, I think ultimately it 
goes back to starting from a very very early age because from my experience as a mum I've really seen that um, girls opinions and boys opinions of women's sport is formed from sort of three four years old as young as that um, and I think if you allow those opinions to, to kind of grow and foster and for example if you I know we're in lockdown but if you walk past the school playground one way you can sort of see in without looking like a weirdo and being asked to move on you'll probably see quite quickly that um boys in the main are kind of dominating the central space of the playground and girls tend to be pushed to the sidelines girls and boys who aren't keen on sport um, and there's a lot of educational research that that shows that um, so I, I think that's a really concerning dynamic to to be experiencing at sort of four or five years old uh, it's basically man spreading happening uh, at primary school and it tells girls you know regardless of whether we ever care if they go into sport or not that that they just don't deserve to take up as much physical space and uh, I just think that's deeply deeply problematic so um, personally I see the solution very much based in schools and primary schools in particular um, and then that work being built on and, and continued in secondary schools and adapted to to support girls through puberty and to support boys to understand uh, the changes of, of women's bodies through puberty uh, and to kind of be completely comfortable with that and just um, normalise talking about it. So yeah, I think I think a lot comes down to making PE a core curriculum subject, which it isn't at the moment, which is ridiculous. So you know you can be really terrible at maths, and your maths teacher is obliged to um, help you learn all your sums or learn the part part whole system, which I still can't get my head around. Uh, millions of mothers across and fathers across the country are struggling with it right now. Um, but they are not obliged to make sure that children reach a certain level of physical literacy. Um, which is, I think, really unhelpful. And it, it's a really important term, particularly through lockdown as well, because I know the government is saying, you know, kids or, or adults or whatever, kids can go out into the park and have a walk or a cycle or a run um, to keep fit, kind of basic fitness level. But that's not the same as being physically literate. And that is something that you have to learn and you, you go through as a child to learn. So that, that education around your body and how it moves and how it works and um, the kind of technical skills that you develop is really, really important. Um, that's gone a long way from the answer to your question. But I think, unfortunately, <laughs> it is rooted in there because unless you make sport completely normal for kids, um, I think they're always going to see women's sport as a kind of lesser thing and therefore not worthy of their attention. Thank you. That was fantastic because you answered that question and you answered one of my other questions about PE in school. So you did them both in one go with that name. Okay. And so I'm going to move on to actually to take that and move it on. You said about men not caring. I care about women's sport. Hashtag I care. Um, so Carol, lovely Carol, can I throw that across Carol Thurl Jones? Are you happy to ask your question? You didn't know I was going to ask you that. You thought I was going to ask it for you. Uh, are you happy to ask your question? I uh, The question about any tips for dealing with online trolls? Yes, there you are. You've answered it. Yeah, but uh, yes. Oh, Carol, that's a good question. Um, do you know, I shouldn't say this because it'll probably jinx it, but I've actually not had terrible problems with online trolls. Um, I don't know how. I don't know how I've managed it because a lot of my friends in the industry and just, you know, a lot of women generally have had awful troubles. Um, you know, a good friend of mine, Jackie Oatley, has you know had, had uh, all physical threats to her safety um she was receiving letters at the bbc um and she was having to walk when she finished her shift heavily pregnant through a dark car park on her own at night after receiving these really scary letters um and obviously we've seen all the stuff that's happened to um karen carney alex scott um a, a young female journalist called mariam naz wrote a piece uh, a blog piece recently which was it was really powerful it really got me um she it was in response to the karen carney case and she wrote about how she'd written a blog about ronaldo um, and the allegations around him having uh, sexually assaulted one particular woman, but potentially more than one woman. Um, and the responses that she got off the back of that were just deeply, deeply disturbing. You know, people sending really um, vile, frightening messages to colleagues, um, family, um, friends, and e even even resulted in somebody in real life approaching her that she didn't know and talking to her about this column in quite a threatening way. 
um some really really scary stuff for a young, young woman who's you know just starting out in the industry and trying to make her way um I, I wouldn't say that I've never had horrible things of course I have I've had people writing into <laughs> to the newspaper and saying I don't know what I'm talking about or saying that I don't know I think I got accused of being a Nazi once which was ridiculous because I um, you know my family's Jewish so that was didn't make any sense um I I was told to that I should commit suicide because I'm such a terrible mother um but luckily you know I was actually in, in a really positive space at the time so it didn't didn't affect me but you know you think about if you were to receive any of those messages at a time when you perhaps didn't feel so strong which many of us don't you know we all go through ups and downs in life and and I certainly have done um and I'm, I'm just thankful that I haven't had that sort of persistent trolling that I know some people have, but then I don't, you know. So how do you deal with it? Is really what you're asking, isn't it, Carol? Um, I find, and this isn't always the case, but I do find um, that some people you can reply to and you can have, so long as you don't, you know, go, go really angry with them, but you just sort of logically state your case. I do find that most people will sort of back off or come round. Um, but there are certain people who you should just completely avoid and uh, just mute them. There's one there's one individual that I've had to mute because uh, he is just so um, dangerous and vile and, you know, there's no sort of telling how far he will go. I know that he's he's done lots of horrible things to lots of other women in the industry. So he's just on mute now and I don't have any idea what he's up to, which is the best way. Because unfortunately, um, there's, there's quite limited protection that social media companies can offer and, that, or, and also that police can offer. I mean, we're still in the process of trying to make misogynism a hate crime, for example, which is ridiculous. Um, misogyny sorry not misogynism made that up um so yeah I, I think as women we are pretty un, under protected and under supported on those platforms and um often the advice is to kind of you know take yourself off them and I, I just don't think that that is a solution because then we're having to quieten down our voices um yeah I, I think we've got quite a long way to go before online is a safe space thank you thank you Ella. Um, Carol Bates, are you? I think you're on. I saw you. I can see you there. Would you like to ask your question? Oh, you're on mute. I was going to say at some point this evening, wasn't I? <laughs> right, I'm on I'm, I'm mute now. <laughs> um, it's really sort of thinking about the book and thinking about myself. And so, in my teenage years, I was one of those girls that didn't particularly like sports too much. The very red face, sweat, the one that always had the blue troop face and the, and the sweat everywhere and totally lacking in confidence in your teenage years and your, and your 20s. Um, but now, I think sort of 20, 30 years later, I have the confidence. I love playing sport, whether I'm sweaty, beetroot-based or, or whatever I look like. I actually don't care now. And I think those years in between, how do we sort of get younger women to believe that they're going to be confident and they're going to not worry about what people think but how do we get them to believe that at a younger age so it doesn't sort of stop them doing things yeah that's such a good question hello carol i, I haven't met carol before she runs cruelly old girls which is one of the most inspirational projects <laughs> i've ever come across i absolutely love it and um well you should connect with her after this to find out more <laughs> if you don't know her <laughs> Um, but I feel like she's like saving the lost generations of women who missed out on sport is basically what she's doing, which is incredible. Um, it's, a, it's something that I think about a lot because I have got two daughters and my oldest is, is nine. And we talk quite a lot just recently, actually, we've really started to talk a lot about embarrassment because <laughs> it seems to be something that comes up a lot for her. And it's really interesting to me how really small things are embarrassing. Um, and uh, I also saw a post recently um, of a mother with a six-year-old girl who noticed that on the Google Classrooms, I don't know if any of you are parents that are using Google Classroom, but they noticed that um, the girls were, were not volunteering to answer questions. And they were feeling really uninhibited in this kind of virtual classroom setting. Um, and so she, she wanted to kind of explore that and, and interrogate it. And I think that there is this this kind of culture I noticed that I've grown up with it of 
and, and this is generalizing because lots of women won't feel this way, but of being worried about making a mistake um, and feeling like you have to be perfect all the time. And a mistake carries extra weight as a woman, um, particularly if you're in a kind of male dominated environment. But just generally, you know, we're in a male dominated culture. And so it, it applies all the time and it might apply more in certain settings than other settings. Um, and it just makes us feel very vulnerable and it makes us feel like those mistakes are kind of, you know, you. You can't come back from them um and, and i've also noticed <laughs> that uh you know we always say that women apologize all the time and i don't think men apologize that much um but there's a <laughs> i think there's a real sort of strength in in owning your mistakes not not apologizing for them necessarily although I'd, I'd, i think an apology is quite a polite thing i'm not against apologies um but just being quite confident about, yes, I made a mistake and, you know, and now I've moved on and now we're on to the next absolutely mind-blowingly brilliant thing that I'm doing in this workplace or I'm doing in the family setting, as I always do. And, um, you know, having that really sort of skilled, light touch approach to mistakes. And I think that is something that we have to that we have to teach girls. Um, I, I don't know why there is this gender difference, even at such a very young age. I suppose it's is it cultural? Is it biological? Is it a mixture? I don't know. But it's it's something that I'm yeah, certainly something that's very close to home. And I'm talking to my daughter about a lot. And I keep telling her and this is the key thing that I've learned over the years, because I used to be incredibly shy. And if if my 12 year old self knew that I was talking about pubes on a zoom call with a bunch of women I just would have died inside like what are you doing um but I I think I've realized and this is what I want to impart to my daughter is that when you lose the inhibitions when you forget about the embarrassment when you can move past past it your life is just so much better <laughs> it's so much more fun um you're more likely to be successful um you have less kind of worries in your head it, it's completely liberating so I think if we can show women and girls that um in a more convincing way hopefully they will all start to change Thank you. And I, I think for me, that was the most powerful, one of the most powerful elements for me in the book was that piece around why girls can't roll down hills and get muddy and sweaty. And so we're trying to make schools, you know, ha have hair dryers and uh, feminise that environment. But actually, why can't we, girl, young girls enjoy sport exactly in the same way that boys do? So, and I know for me, that certainly, uh, yeah, stuck with me for a long time after reading that in the book. I'm going to try and do two more questions if I can. Kate Hannon, can I, I can't remember what your questions were? You gave me loads and they were all excellent. So just choose one of them, really. Okay, thank you, Sue. Um, and I, I love the book, absolutely love the book. And it resonated with me on so many levels because I absolutely adore sport. I've never played county sport and I'm a really average netballer and I can run about four and a half kilometers, but never five. So. But I never, ever thought of myself as sporty, but I love sport. We watch sport on the television here all the time. My husband and I both watch everything. I watch everything from darts to bowls and everything in between. So I love the fact that your book almost gave me permission to be sporty. So I've, bec I've become sporty, even though I've never classified myself as sporty. That isn't my question. I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, my question really was, in the way that um, Katla Moran has written different books in her in her life at different stages and she, looking back on her life it's given her different perspectives if you were to write that book again now what would the differences be yeah that's a great question thanks Kate and um I, I love that you ran four and a half kilometers but never more that's <laughs> um there's another woman who I follow on Instagram who swears by a seven minute run so she can manage she doesn't do more than seven minutes but she just she gets that done and I love that like why you know there's no rule that says you have to run 5k you just run whatever feels good having said that um recently I started doing the couch to 5k which I'd never done before and people had always been raving at me oh it's so so good and you know get Jo Wiley as your coach she's the best um so I started doing it with one of the mums at school and I've absolutely loved it and we're now running we're now smashing out the 5ks I've got to say I never thought I would but give it a go give it a go um she's she's really lovely joe and she sort of encapsulates joe wiley that is i feel like i know her because she's talking in my ear but of course i don't know her um anyway she's lovely and she sort of encapsulates all those fears and uh, sort of insecurities uh that that i think so many of us can relate to which is really really nice um 
I've forgotten your question now. Oh, what would I have put in the book? Um, looking back, I think I would have put um, more about women's sport itself. The, the, the live women's sport, the experience of going to watch women's sport. Um, and I, I think it wasn't, I don't know, it seems a strange thing to, to say now, but it wasn't as obvious to me then as it is now. You know, there wasn't the same sort of tradition of going to, uh, well, it's, it's still a growing tradition now, but of going to WSL matches, for example, in a way that I think it's much more normalised now. You know, people will literally message me and say, how can I go to a WSL match? Or I'm going to a Premier 15s game, for example, or whatever it is. Um, so I would have liked to put more about that in it. Um, I probably would have liked to speak to um, more older women as well um and and written more about that i would have liked to have access to more sports science because i feel like the, the sports science that's in there is really rudimentary um one of our writers fiona thomas she's been doing some really really important work at the telegraph uncovering stories around um female concussion which had never been written about in the uk before she started writing about it um and it, it's it's absolutely frightening <laughs> i think there's lots of sports that are worried about it you know women's rugby is an obvious one but also hockey um cycling i've had problems too gymnastics obviously lots of snow sports um, and football too um but it's really important that we have an awareness of how you know how sport can can negatively impact our bodies as well as positively um so yeah, and I, and I think also, you know, I was so caught up in wanting to kind of make sure that women fell in love with sport in this book that I perhaps, I don't know, I think I did put lots of negative things about sport in it, but I don't know. Sometimes I think I look back and think, oh, did I sell it as a bit of a, a panacea? Um, whereas maybe I could have written more about some of the, I don't know, sex abuse stuff and, and the ways that sport can be twisted in it in a negative way and how we have to ensure that that doesn't happen um maybe i don't know but i quite like that you i want you to come away feeling joyful so maybe that would have ruined it i don't know maybe there's uh, another book in you then anna what this year though anna can you do it a bit <laughs> later please definitely not this year god no um i've got thank you kate i've got time for i think one more question that i've got here from Catherine duncan cat duncan are you on the call and are you happy to ask your own question hi yeah hello um firstly to say um i love the book so thank you um i was just wondering how you viewed um the development of um sports that have come from a kind of a primary from the majority of women's participation um, so such as like netball, which perhaps after your book was published has seen kind of more of a prominence. Um, just how you thought that has impacted the narrative and view of women's sport? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, oh, hello, Kat from World Sailing as well. We're really excited about Pip Hare. We're following her journey at the moment. Um, she's, she's blogging for us, which is brilliant. Um, netball just went through this amazing, amazing transformation. Um, after I wrote the book so that's another thing that I probably would have wanted to put in there um, I'd always had this sort of complicated relationship with netball because I I knew that it was the sport that I was told to do because I was a girl um, and that boys didn't play it and it wasn't you know when I walked past the betting shops where I was growing up it was never pictured in the window <laughs> I don't think I don't know if anyone ever bet on on netball but that sort of told me that it wasn't significant in the grand scheme of things or it wasn't important it wasn't seen as important um, and I think in some ways that hasn't changed enough. You know, so many people when we were looking at the pandemic problem said to me, the fact that indoor sport isn't allowed, like we get it, it's because of transmission rates and everything else, but actually women disproportionately do many, many indoor sports. So when you think about swimming, women are definitely overrepresented in swimming. And of course there is wild swimming and outdoor swimming too, but majority of women are swimming in indoor pools. Um, netball is an obvious example. Also ice skating, gymnastics. Um, yeah, and, and that was really, that was an impossible question for, for the government to tackle. Of course, indoor sports had to be kind of the taboo thing, but I think it was just the way it was, I don't know, it was just accepted that it was going to be fine just to ban indoor sports, that they didn't need to do anything. They didn't need to recognise that women were very, very likely to be 
doing their sport or physical activity indoors and that therefore banning it was going to have a disproportionate effect on women. Um, I think also, of course, of like Zumba and exercise classes as well um, and yoga too. And yes, some people can do those things over Zoom virtually in their homes and other people, you know, they don't necessarily have the broadband strength. They might not have the space. They might not have five minutes themselves if they've got kids running around. Um, We've all talked about doing family yoga now in our house and we literally we just don't have a room that we could possibly all do that in. Um, or me and my husband don't even have a room that we could do that in together. So, yeah, very many in, um, challenges around indoor. That's gone on a right ramble. But I think netball have had it so hard because they haven't been able to play all year. And for a sport that was massively in the ascendancy from winning Commonwealth gold, then hosting the World Cup here and having record crowds. There were record domestic crowds in, in the Super League at the start of the year, I think in February. Um, and then just to have it wiped completely um, just felt very, very harsh and without sort of due care and consideration to, to the fact that that was a, a pretty gendered problem. Um, yeah, it's is difficult. Thank you so much. Anna, could you just talk to us a little bit about the supplement tomorrow, please? So we can all um, rush out and make a purchase. Yeah, please do. Um, obviously, if you don't, some people don't buy newspapers or some people aren't able to get to the shops at the moment. So completely understand. And it will be rolled out online. Um, it starts, start publishing from 6am tomorrow. Um, and it's, it's probably the most, if you don't know what the supplement is, so it's a monthly 12 page supplement in print. That's just 12 pages of women's sport. We obviously have women's sport all through the month anyway, but this is a, a particular, um, separate publication which is is quite special um we were really thrilled to win supplement of the year last year beating off all kinds of amazing like heavyweight competition which was it wasn't just obviously it was a nice victory for us but i think more than that to see that women's sport women's sport as a subject was being praised by these non-women sports specialists not even sports specialists it was at the press awards so i don't even know how sporty the judging panel were but they they just really loved the content i think is is real testimony to the the interesting stories that women's sport gives us and the important ideas around it and um, anyway I really, really, really wish I could tell you why it's so special tomorrow. But the most I will be able to say is that we have a guest editor who's done a takeover and she is she's just phenomenal. And it's been a complete honour to work with her. And it's a project we've been working on for quite a long time. And um, hence the massive bags under my eyes. I'm absolutely shattered. But um, it's really exciting. And I hope that um, you're able to consume it either digitally or in print um, from tomorrow. And I hope you enjoy it. It's giving me goosebumps now. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I'm very, very excited to hear that. That's fantastic. Oh, we're very lucky to have you this evening then. That was, good. That was great timing as that's uh, gone to print. Um, yeah, that was a coincidence. That was a lovely coincidence. I'd love if I could do, we've just got a couple of moments left before we thank um, Anna. I did ask you, I haven't told you this, Anna. I asked everyone to bring along their books or a picture of the book so we could get a lovely Zoom photo of everybody. If you've got one, oh, taking oh, yourself oh, off you. of your, um, <laughs> if you'd like to take yourself off of, uh, not mute, or your camera's open. Actually, I don't think I, can, I can't actually hold mine and take a photograph too. So I'm going to take the photographs. You have to hold them for a few seconds. So up at the screen, I'm doing, the, I'm doing the first ones here. You won't know who you are, so just keep smiling, really. That's amazing. Lovely. I'm gonna do, I've got two more screens to do, so hold hold on. Keep holding on there. Oh, lovely. Everyone's coming off, off of the... Lovely. Okay, another moment. Lovely. And one more. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. That's it. Nope, we're good. That's okay, lovely. Cool. That's incredible. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, it'd be a lovely picture to share with with you for later. Thank you so, so much. And we have, I'll share the chat with you. You've got some lovely comments. Yes, indeed, from everybody there. But I really, really appreciate that. And thank you for um, giving your time and a bit, you know, <laughs> such a busy life of juggling work and life and everything else too. But we really, really appreciate that. It's, um, I hope everybody got as much from it as, as I did. I think it's a little bit selfish. One of my favourite all-time books, really. So it's been very lovely to have you on here. But um but I hope everybody else enjoyed talking to Anna and we'll obviously keep following uh, the progress of the 
Telegraph Women's Sport and all that you're doing. Um, in terms of future book clubs, so please do I say feedback and let us know how you think it went and if we can do it differently in the future. Uh, next month, we've got Kath Spencer, who is the former England rugby captain, coming to talk about her book, Mudge More Mascara, at some February the 16th. And then Susie Petricelli is talking about Raised a Warrior. So she was a Harvard footballer who's done a lot um, with US women's soccer. Um, and that's on March 22nd. And then next Friday night, we've got Stacey Copeland, uh, who's come to talk to us, who just like an evening with Stacey. So we've got an hour with her next Friday evening, I think from seven. And Stacey was a professional footballer and has been a, a professional bo boxer. And actually, we just retired last week. So that we didn't know that when we invited her on. But she, if anyone's heard her talk or her TEDx talk, she is an absolutely amazing and a real inspiration. And she'll, you know, be fantastic to listen to. So... Thank you all so much and thank you to Anna so much for being here and to Kate for helping manage it all and we really look forward to seeing you all at an event um, at some point again soon I hope so thank you all. Thanks Sue. Okay, thank Anna. Thanks Sue. Thanks so much bye. For Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. bye. bye.